Well, we're in our second week of a series called en Enemies of Discernment. And if you were here last week, you know that we talked about different things that come against us when, it's, when we're talking about wisdom and God's wisdom in our life and us making good decisions. And we kind of related it over to the superhero world. We talked about the fact that this week or this summer has been the kind of the summer of the superhero, all kinds of superhero movies out there. And then we talked about that, uh, that, that there are certain superheroes in the Bible. We talked about a couple in, in particular. We talked about Samson, who had this superhero strength, this power of, uh, of strength that, that would come over him as the Holy Spirit would come over him. And then uh, we talked about Solomon, who had a superhero strength of wisdom. And just talked about their lives and how Solomon's life, even though he had all these strengths and all these gifts, how he threw all of it away and just through poor decisions and, and, and just allowing certain things to, to, to basically train wreck his life. And then Solomon, who could have had anything, asked for wisdom. And as a result of that, God gave him that and so much more. And he, so he made his entire kingdom was based on wise, godly decisions. And the difference between those two people, those two superheroes in the Bible. Now, we talked about that there are certain things that will definitely derail our discernment or our wisdom. And we called them discernment kryptonite. So we talked about the things that can enter into our lives that can cause us not to make wise decisions and not to have God's wisdom. We also realize with, within looking at Scripture that anybody can have the superhero power of God's wisdom. James says that if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So all we got to do is ask for it, and God will give it to us. But there are some things that will come against us, and that's what we talked about last week. Pride is one of them. Pride was something that definitely affected, uh, affected Samson. It caused him to make a lot of stupid choices, a lot of big mistakes because of his pride issues. Yet Solomon w uh, warned against pride. He said things like pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. We also said that liquor or drugs can work against wisdom. We said that, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a drink as long as you're doing it within certain guidelines, the biblical guidelines. We said, you know, one drink won't make you stupid, but several drinks will make you stupid. Okay, we talked about that. So we said both of those could be uh, kryptonite when it comes to wisdom. Anger was another one, boy, that, that Samson really, really struggled with and Solomon warned against. Lust. Lust ultimately brought Samson down, and it's very uh, a progressive lust is in our lives, and if we're not careful, it can cloud our judgment. Greed was another one uh, that we saw. Saul, uh, Samson always wanted more. Nothing was ever good enough. He always had to have exactly what he wanted, so greed uh, wrecked that superhero's life. Hatred was another one, and then impatience, and that's what we ended on last week. And so in keeping with the superhero theme, it's interesting, with superheroes, have you ever noticed they always make the right decision? They always make the correct choice. They always come out on top. And here's one of my favorite clips that shows that. Tony Stark made the right choice. He had a choice. He could either be selfish and just save himself, or he could take a chance and save the world. And it all worked out for Tony, and it seems like that's the way it is for superheroes. Now, Probably, we're not going to wake up tomorrow and be asked to divert a nuclear bomb from Grand Junction by throwing it into space. That's probably not a decision that we're going to have to face. But we do face decisions every day. Some moral and ethical. Some about our family. Some about our finances. Some about our jobs or our careers. And I think each and every one of us would say that, you know what, going into those decisions, I sure would like to have a little help. I sure would like to have a little wisdom. I, sh I, I would like to know really what God would want me to do in those decisions. And that is what, those are the type of things that we will face on a daily basis and the kind of decisions that God wants to be involved in. Well, this morning we're going to look at a different superhero in the Bible. We're going to look at the life of Joseph. Now, Joseph was the son of Jacob. Joseph was the favored son. He's the one that was written about that had the, the coat of many colors. And uh, Joseph was favored by God as well. And he started having dreams at a very young age about what God was going to do through him and do in his life. He shared those dreams because he was excited about it. He shared those dreams with his, his brothers and he shared those dreams with his father, which didn't go over very well. In fact, they hated him for it. And his brothers ended up selling him into slavery as a result went back and told his father that he had died out in the wilderness. But he was sold into slavery to Egypt. 
And he was sold to a particular captain of the palace, Pharaoh's palace guard by the name of Potiphar. Within a very short period of time, God's favor showed up again in Joseph's life. And even though he was in a foreign land, in a foreign territory, with foreign languages all around him, he was blessed and favored, and he rose in the ranks when it came to Potiphar's, Potiphar's household. And that's where we pick up in Scripture today in Genesis 39. The Bible says, verse 7, at about this time, Potiphar's wife began to desire him and invited him to sleep with her. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He's held back nothing from me except you because you were his wife. How could I ever do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on him day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he was doing this, his work inside the house. She came and grabbed him by his shirt, demanding, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but as he did, his shirt came off. She was left holding it as he ran from the house. So this is a big-time moral dilemma that Joseph is in the middle of. And one of the things you see about Joseph in his life is not only did he make wise, wise decisions, but he also uh, showed a lot of self-control. And in this situation, she was his authority. I guarantee it. I mean, you know, it would have been easy for him probably if she was butt ugly, okay, just be honest. But she was probably hot. And she was hot, so she was coming on to him, and she didn't let up. I mean, she just on and on and on until finally he just had to run away from her. And, and he, he, it, it's obvious there that he has God's wisdom, and it's obvious there that he had some type of superhero strength and self-control to be able to continue to, to deny her. So what was it? What was it in him? And that's what we talked about last week when we ended. We said, well, what are some secrets when it comes to, to discernment? We talked about some things, that we, ways we can be derailed. But what can we do to make sure that we make righteous decisions? That we have the right situation, that we make the right decisions in any situations that may face us. Because we all know if we listen to God, we'll be better off than if we listen to our own emotions. I mean, it would have been very easy there for Joseph to have his own emotions and allow them to take over. He could have been like Samson and allowed lust to take him over or allowed anger to take him over. I mean, Samson in the same situation would have probably slept with her. He probably would have killed Potiphar's uh, 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 husband. I mean, that probably are the decisions that he made, but Joseph didn't. There's something special about him. What did he do? What was different about Joseph? Well, the first thing he did was he looked around and he saw his blessings. I mean, when he was tempted that way, when he, when he had that decision, that crossroad in his life, he looked around and he saw how blessed he was. The Bible says, but Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He was blessed. I mean, anybody to, to be able to go into a foreign land as a slave and be, and be elevated to the the position that he was in he knew that he would be giving up great things to trade for for that i mean he was so blessed that he was like i can't that's not worth it it's not a good trade for me i'm so blessed i'm not gonna i'm not going to trade that for a, a a fling with you and you know what we're all blessed we are all so blessed now we may look around and compare our blessings to others and say well we're not as blessed as them but but hey we have homes i mean you you drove here in a car i mean you may have kicked it a few times to get it started but it got you here you have family you have friends i mean we are so blessed to even live in grand junction i mean to live in colorado you know, I was sitting out the other night, and I was just, I was on my porch, and, and it was in the evening, and it had been like 95 during the day, and it cooled off to like 65 at night. You know, that doesn't happen everywhere in the country. I remember when I graduated from high school, I was like, ah, get me, Colorado stinks, get me out of here, let me go somewhere. So God humbled me, and he sent me to the south. And I realized that at midnight on a summer night, it's the same temperature as midday on a summer day. It never cools off. Here's the other thing about the South. You take a shower and you hang your towel up, it's still wet a day later. It never dries out. The devil has placed bugs in the South. <laughs> and, and all they are there for is to torment you. 
You know what a chigger is? Hey, teenagers, let me tell you something. Chiggers, all, all. They are from the pits of hell. And if you go out in the grass, and dewy grass in the south, and you don't have high, uh, uh, tall socks on or boots on, you will come back, and you don't know you got them. That's the tricky thing about chiggers. You don't know you have them until that night. And then you'll get these little these whelps, and they, these things bore into your skin. And, and they'll, they die when they want to die. You can't kill them, and they itch, and they're horrible. And, oh, we don't have chiggers in Colorado. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. They have spiders that could pull chariots in the south. People here complain about mosquitoes. That is the Louisiana State bird. They're so big. And here's the thing, you know, we can complain. We, sometimes we complain, well, oh, the summer's here, whatever, da, 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 there's nothing to do. Okay, we do the same thing about winters. Oh, Colorado winters, they're so harsh. Go to North Dakota in the winter, okay? Go to North Dakota in the winter and see how that is. I got the opportunity to do that, okay? I asked somebody before I went, I said, what is North Dakota like? What are, well, right now, what, what are man camps like? He says, hmm, picture this. Nuclear holocaust has happened. All the women and children are dead. There's only men left. <laughs> and they live in FEMA trailers. And they live in these camps together. That's what North Dakota is like, many parts of it, in, in the winter. Now, when, when I went there, let me, and we had gracious hosts. It was awesome how sweet they were to us. But let me tell you, it made me so appreciate you guys that have to travel and have to do, have to do life and work to support your families in different places. Thank you for what you're due. And I hope that you're, yes, I hope your families know. And if you don't, do a three-week hitch as a mission trip to North, to North Dakota in the winter and see the sacrifice that they're making uh, to support their families. Because let me tell you, it's, it's tough. But let me, let me, what it did for me more than anything made me appreciate home. Made me appreciate how blessed I am. And, and, and we are so blessed I mean, why would we want to make those kind of decisions? Why would we want to make that, those, some of those choices? Because sometimes they do. Sometimes people do. They'll make a stupid choice that costs them everything. It costs them every blessing that they could ever have. So he realized what he had. The second thing he did is he, he looked within and he, and he saw his integrity. The Bible says in verse 9, how could I do such a wicked thing? Sometimes it's not what you have, but what you are that weighs heaviest in the decision-making process. I mean, sometimes it's just that, that gift of integrity that God has put in you. That, that Holy Spirit comes and he gives you that conviction just to, to, to steer you clear of things. Now, have you ever been in a situation before and you kind of looked around and go, why, why am I here? Like, what am I doing in this, in this place? A few years ago, uh, we went to a concert, and uh, it was some, some bands that I was really excited to see. And uh, so we went out, and it was kind of one of those concerts where it was outside, and you brought your own chairs, you know, and you sat in the grass. And so we got there early so we could put our chair in a good spot. And then we went and ate, and we came back. And when we came back, we had uh, uh, this guy that had passed out in one of our chairs. I mean, he was gone. He was gone, okay? And it's like, and what do you do in a situation like that? I mean, I mean, we, you just kind of dump them and then hope they just don't hit, you know. We made a nice little place for him in the grass and he f fell asleep and we kept watching the band. And then all of a sudden, well, it was probably an hour later, he wakes up and he kind of staggers around and he walks to the row in front of him and he starts peeing on their chairs. So <laughs> I thought, well, I guess I better go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom and on the way I saw all these people and they were seriously, they were just whacked out now not everybody was that way but they were they were on drugs and they were whacked out and I stumbled over some people that were literally almost having sex on the ground while the concert was going on and as I tripped over them and as I looked at the situation I was like why, do, why am I here because I could listen to this music in my car and not have to see all of this. And I, now, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm all for having fun and going to concerts and doing all that kind of stuff. But sometimes we get ourselves into situations and we go, why are we here? I need to get out of this. Now, in Joseph's situation, I mean, he didn't ask for that. 
He was just going to work. He wasn't trying to put himself in a compromising place. But how many times do we do that? How many times do we know we really shouldn't be here? We shouldn't be in this circumstance. We shouldn't be putting ourselves in this type of position. And, and, and not only just because, you know, it can, it can lend us to moral failure, but I saw all kinds of fights break out that night too. I mean, just for your own safety, sometimes you go, this is not a good place for me. So we need that conscience. We need that integrity that the Holy Spirit puts in us so that we can make those choices and make the right ones. Here's the next thing that Joseph did. He looked forward and saw his future. He looked forward and he saw his future. Verse 9 again says, he has, he has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. He knew that he had no future with somebody else's wife. I mean, he looked at that. He was just a slave boy. I mean, really, could he have an affair with this woman? And are they going to run off together and, and live happily ever after? He knew better than that. And if we could just count every cost of the decision that we were going to make uh, in the future, a lot of times it would change the decisions that we make. One of my favorite books is uh, uh, Samson Syndrome. It's by Mark Attenberry. He, great author, really, really good book. In it, he says this. He says, there's been a lot of talk in recent months about airline safety. He says, would you get on a plane if you knew it stood a 50% chance of crashing? How about 25%? Still too high? How about if there was a 10% chance of that airplane crashing? The crazy thing is, lots of strong men get into sinful situations that have a 100% chance of crashing and never give it a second thought. Then when the crash happens and their whole world is going up in flames, they wonder why they did it. Believe me, friend, the time to look ahead and anticipate the future is before the plan takes off. Look at the situation. See if there's a future there. Try to foresee in your mind what, what, what foreseeable future there is before you make that decision. I was talking to a, a girl, uh, and she's in the dating world again, and she's, you know, trying to figure out, you know, who she needs to date, and if it's time to date, and trying to find the right guy, and she's kind of scared because she dated a guy, and he just was not who he, he portrayed himself to be. And I told her, I said, you know, one of the amazing things about people is that we will go, and when we buy a used car, and we, we are very careful about that car. Is it reliable? I mean, is it going to last a long time? Is it, is it going to get us where we need to go? Is it, is it going to meet my, my needs? Is it going to, you know, is, what, has it been in wrecks? Has it had damage done in the past? And we'll buy car faxes, you know, just to see the history of a used car. And I told her, I said, wouldn't it be really cool if we could buy a guy fax? Right? Or a girl fax? You get a guy fax and you start looking at it and go, oh, it says here commitment issues. Okay? Uh, mama's boy. Mm -hmm. youngest in the family spoiled rotten you know um, doesn't clean up after themselves lets stinkers in bed I mean all of it <laughs> just has it all on there wouldn't that be nice I said wouldn't that be nice to be able to she's like oh that would be great be great if I could just go back and interview all of his exes and they tell me the truth about him we would, I mean, that, that would be nice it would be, it would be nice but the truth is, when we get that information, do we really want to see it? Hmm. Do we really want to know the truth? Would we believe it if we did see it? See, a lot of times we have all kinds of great counsel around us. A lot of times we can get a lot of facts on how a decision is going to affect us in the future, but we don't want to listen what we want to hear is what we want to hear. Talk to most counselors, they'll tell you, most, most counseling sessions only last one or two sessions. Because what we find is, is that people don't really want your advice. People just want somebody to condone the decision they've already decided to make. And so they'll go around and ask enough people till finally somebody tells them something that they want to hear. We do that, guys. It's very easy to fall into that trap. Now you might ask, well, why, is, why do we do that? What, what is the human nature that would cause us to do such a silly thing? And here's the secret. The secret is that an unmet need will always trump logic. Did you catch that? 
an unmet need will always trump logic. Which means if you're lonely enough, and that hurt from that loneliness is big enough, you'll settle for somebody that's not good enough for you. You'll settle. Because you're lonely. If you went out of your job bad enough, if you feel like you're just being disrespected in your job, and, and man, it's just constantly disrespected, 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 you'll have such a need in you to be respected that you will take another job just to get out of there and not look at the foreseeable future. You just will. That's when we talk about uh, in, our, in our marriage seminars and our workshops that we do, that understanding and meeting your spouse's needs is one of the most important things you can ever do. Because you don't want to send your spouse to work hungry. You want to make sure that you're meeting each other's needs. That's huge. Because when people have affairs, they never say, well, I just fell in love with, I saw this person and I fell in love with them. When you ask them what happened, this is the things that they'll say. They'll say, they made me feel good about myself. They told me I looked pretty. We had things in common. We communicated. We talked. That's how the relationship started. All of those things can happen in your marriage. You just have to know that it's a need and you have to know how to meet that need. But it's amazing. If, if we will allow ourselves to go through life with unmet needs, it will cause us to make decisions from emotion instead of from fact. Unmet needs will always trump logic, but the Holy Spirit will trump them all. So staying close to the Lord, staying close to Him, and seeking His wisdom and asking for it for a daily basis, that'll trump that unmet need. But here's the truth. If you have a wound or a hurt that is left unmended, that wound will continue to dictate decisions in your life. And it doesn't have to. You can get help. You can talk to a counselor and go in and really listen to them and get, get, on a, get in a 12-step program. Go through our spiritual warfare uh, uh, course and go through uh, deliverance and restoration. It is a miracle what happens in those, er in those things. It's a miracle. It will change your life and it will completely change how you make decisions. So he counted the cost, man. He looked, looked in the future and saw how it was going to affect him in the future. And then he looked up and he saw his God. That's the fourth thing he did. Verse 9, how could I ever do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. When he looked at all the Lord had done for him in his relationship with the Lord and how God had always had his back, he made the statement, I, I couldn't do that to my Heavenly Father. I couldn't do that to him. You know, if when we are faced with tough decisions, crossroads, turning points in our life, if we just pray, if we just worship, if we just cry out to him, how different would, would, that, would things be? Think about the last time you fell to temptation in an area of your life that was your hot button. And we all got them, right? So think about that time. You might like, oh, that five minutes ago just happened, okay? When you fell, I promise you didn't pray. I promise you didn't spend time in worship. And I promise you didn't cry out to God. <laughs> of course you didn't. If we would do those three things, oh, we would not fall into poor decisions. We just wouldn't. Think about that. Something hits you, and sometimes, guys, you don't have a time to retreat and go away for a weekend and really spend time in prayer. Sometimes you just have to do a microwave prayer where you go, God, help me with this. Help me right now, God. I don't even know what to do in this situation. Please help me. If you do have time to retreat, go get in your car and put worship in and say, God, you got to help me. And saturate yourself with, that, with just that spiritual presence of God. And if you don't hear anything, then cry out to him. Over and over again in the Old Testament, we see God react to Israel's uh, needs when they cry out to him. 
when he sees they're really serious about this. They're, they really need me. I mean, think about this. When are you there for your kids? When they go, hey, can you help me out with this right over here? Or when they go, dad, help! Right? Our Heavenly Father is the same way. When we cry out to him, he comes. He's there for you. I mean, things would be so different if we would just pray, spend some time in worship, really seek God and cry out to him. He will give you the answers. The Bible says he will give you wisdom and discernment if you'll just ask for it. But a lot of times we don't because we're afraid of what God's going to say. What if God says no? What if God doesn't really want me to have this? Because I really want it. What if God doesn't want me to have this house, even though I can't afford it and it's the one I really, really want and I just want it? And so what if he, I'm just not going to pray about it because I don't want him to tell me no? God has your best interest in mind always. And he can see the future. And he does know not what you need or what you want, but what you need. You can trust him. And if he says, no, not that guy, or no, not that girl, you need to thank God. If, if a guy dumps you, have you ever thought about the fact that that is not a rejection of you, but that may be God just coming in and saying, I'm protecting you from this loser. That's a different way to look at it, isn't it? Why doesn't anybody like me? And God's going, you, that guy's a jerk, man. I've just saved you from him. Praise me for that, because I just helped you out. God loves you so much. He wants you to have a blessed and favored life. He wants to have intimate relationships with you to where you are just so close to him that you don't have to retreat to hear his voice. You can do that, but you can hear his whisper. That's how much God loves you, that you can recognize even a whisper from his voice. That's the kind of, of, of relationship he wants to have with you where, where if you need something, Oh, he can give you the answer. If you're struggling with a decision, oh, he's right there. If you don't know which way to turn, he'll go, oh, right, over here. That's what God wants for you, and you can always trust him. He's not that father that abused you. He's not that boss that took advantage of you. He's your heavenly father, and he loves you more than anybody's ever loved you in your whole life. And he wants the best for you. God, we just come before you this morning and we do want to make sure that you're at the center of every part of our life. And we thank you, Lord, that in Scripture you've given us examples of people that have listened to you and people that haven't. And Lord, help us to learn from their mistakes. I pray, God, that you would just develop such an intimate relationship between us that we would hear your very whisper. Lord God, that we would trust that when we go to you, You'll give us the answer that we need, not what we want. That you're not, into, you're not in the business of disappointing us or hurting us or judging us. You're in the business of loving us. And we praise you for that. And now I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would loosen us your wisdom and your discernment. That that would be a spiritual gift in us and that people would see in us that, that discernment and wisdom working on a daily basis. She'd help us to see to the heart of the matter in every situation. And Lord, when you do, we will listen to you. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. See you next weekend.